Good afternoon and welcome everyone. My name is Michael Anderson and I'm an executive at Saab as well as a board director here at the Atlantic Council. On behalf of Saab and the Atlantic Council's forward defense practice as well as, as the Adrian Arsht Latin America Center, I would like to welcome you to this exciting first installment of our 2023 Commander Series titled A Conversation with General Laura Richardson on Security Across Americas. General Richardson, thank you so much for joining us today. When Saab and the Atlantic Council first launched the Commander Series in 2009, our vision was to establish a flagship speaker forum for senior military and defense leaders to discuss the most important security challenges both now and in the future. This series has been very useful for defense companies like Saab, helping us better understand challenges and priorities in order to inform our investments and partnerships particularly when it comes to research and development, all better preparing ourselves to meet future capability needs. Today's event is the first installment of the Commander Series in 2023. Last year, we had the honor of hosting Commander of U.S. Space Command General James Dickinson to discuss how the U.S. military responds to the new strategic realities of the space domain, followed by Secretary of the Army Christine Wormuth for a conversation on the global challenges facing the U.S. Army, and the Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral Mike Gilday, to discuss his navigation plan for building, maintaining, and equipping a dominant naval force. Today's event will turn us to the Western Hemisphere. Our speakers will consider how the U.S. military can build upon partnerships and enhance regional security with our neighbors in Latin America and the Caribbean. We're delighted to host the commander of U.S. Southern Command, General Laura Richardson, to discuss her plans and priorities for addressing threats and challenges falling in her area of responsibility. General, again, thank you for spending time with us today. I'm very much looking forward to hearing your insights over the course of the next hour. With that, it is my pleasure to introduce Adrian Arsht, who will make a couple of announcements and further introduce our esteemed guests. Adrian Arst is the Executive Vice Chair of the Atlantic Council. Pertinent to today's conversation, she founded the Council's Adrian Arst Latin America Center with the purpose of encouraging the inclusion of South American perspectives in the transatlantic community. She also serves as the founder of the Council's Adrian Arst Rockefeller Foundation Resilience Center. An avid philanthropist, Adrian contributes to artistic, business, and civic growth in the three cities she calls home, Washington, D.C., Miami, and New York. Adrian, thank you for joining us today. Over to you. Thank you, Mike. And we are, as Mike said, so fortunate to be joined by Commander of U.S. Southern Command, General Laura Richardson, for this very special conversation. I've had the privilege of both visiting the southern region, most recently traveling to Panama, and previously living near Southcom headquarters in Miami, Florida. I've seen the unique and important role that U.S. Southern Command plays in promoting engagement with our partners and allies in the Western Hemisphere. Here at the Atlantic Council, the Scowcroft Center's forward defense practice shapes the debate around the greatest military and defense challenges facing the United States and its allies. The Council's Adrian Arsch Latin America Center shapes conversations and action regarding regional transformations while demonstrating why Latin America and the Caribbean matter to the world. Today's conversation cuts across our functional and regional disciplines. Over the next hour, we will look at some of the top security risks and opportunities in Latin America and the Caribbean while looking at U.S. Southern Command's role in promoting security and prosperity across the region. General Richardson has served as commander of U.S. Southern Command since October 2021. She is the first woman to hold this post and the second woman to reach the rank of general in the U.S. Army. In her role, she oversees contingency planning, operations, and security co cooperation in an area of responsibility spanning Central America, South America, and much of the Caribbean. 
General Richardson previously served as the commanding general of U.S. Army North within U.S. Northern Command, further highlighting her deep military experience and expertise within the entire Western Hemisphere. General Richardson, thank you for your dedication to Latin America and Caribbean security. We look forward to hearing your perspective during the event today. I'm also pleased to introduce Courtney Cuby, who is the moderator of today's conversation. Courtney is an NBC News correspondent covering defense and foreign policy. She regularly breaks exclusive news on military operations with experience reporting from U.S. military bases around the world. Thank you to our speakers and the audience for joining the Atlantic Council for what I know will be a captivating conversation. And now I turn the program over to General Richardson for a keynote speech. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, uh, and it's very, very good to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you for putting this program together. Uh, I'm very honored to be able to do it and be able to talk about this very important hemisphere, the Western Hemisphere, and this region. Because this region matters, and it matters a lot uh, to our national security and our homeland in the United States. Uh, I call this our neighborhood. And, um, and that resonates with all of our partner nations because we are part of a neighborhood. And, uh, and to be part of a neighborhood, you've got to be good neighbors. You've got to take care of each other. And that's what we do in the Western Hemisphere. And so what I want to do is just talk to you a little bit about, uh, about the region, about what U.S. Southern Command does, why this region matters. Uh, it matters to national security for our homeland, as I just said. Uh, and um, I believe that we have some competition. And right here uh, on the 20-yard line to our homeland, as I like to say, in the red zone. And, um, and we haven't had competition like this before. And uh, we have to do things a little bit differently. And so I, don't want, I want to talk to uh, everybody here about that. But, uh, and thank you for Courtney uh, being here too and being part of this. Uh, but, in terms of U.S. Southern Command and this region, so uh, this region for U.S. Southern Command consists of Central America, South America, and the Caribbean. It's 31 countries, 12 dependencies, uh, 850 million people, 8% of the world's population. Uh, it's huge. For the Department of Defense, we break down the globe into six geographic uh, areas, and this is one of the six. And uh, certainly there's a lot of uh, activity, but this region is so rich in resources. Uh, our history, our family ties, our culture, uh, our trade, our security, migration, we are uh, inextricably linked to the Western Hemisphere. We are part of the Americas, and this region absolutely matters to the national security of our country. Uh, in Southern Command, we have, uh, or I have, eight subordinate commands. I've got one from every service, which I call component commands, including a special operations command. And then I have three joint task forces as well. I have Joint Interagency Task Force South, based out of Key West, Florida. I've got uh, Joint Task Force Gitmo, or Guantanamo Bay, that's in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. And also Joint Task Force Bravo, which is in Sotocano, uh, Honduras. And so with those commands, not just U.S. Southern Command, but through those eight subordinate commands, we are in the region every day, uh, working very hard to uh, support our partner nations uh, and support our partner nation militaries and security forces to make them stronger, to be able to, have, uh, uh, to, be able to um, uh, help with their challenges that they are having internally, but also externally. And so uh, just in terms of the, the work that we do across the nation, uh, through my lines of effort, my vision, strategy, campaign plan, uh, strengthen partnerships first and foremost, counter the threats in the region, and then also build our team. And building our team also consists of not just internally, but absolutely externally. Uh, our Secretary of Defense, Austin, talks a lot about integrated deterrence. 
I think that integrated deterrence, we've actually been doing integrated deterrence uh, for several years in the, in the Western Hemisphere and in this region. Uh, we don't get all the resources that we quite need. The res nobody ever has all the resources that they would like to have. Uh, but we, uh, we use and uh, to our ability and best of our ability the relationships that we have. We leverage it causes us to because we, we don't have all the resources that we need to reach out and think of innovative ways, uh, other people that we can gain synergy and leverage uh, to be part of team democracy, team USA, team democracy, and get after the challenges that are in the region. And so, um, quite honestly, we use not just my component commands, the eight subordinate commands, but also uh, we are uh, very much involved with the interagency. Very important that we have that link with the interagency. I've got 16 interagency liaison officers that work out of my headquarters at Southcom to help facilitate that and leverage that. Obviously, with the headquarters in Miami, uh, Miami, Florida, Doral, Florida, uh, we are that's a diaspora for the interagency already. It's a diaspora for all of the, the Consular General Corps right there in Miami. A uh, huge lever. Uh, as I call them, and I meet with them frequently and see them at different community events uh, throughout the year, but leveraging their ability to communicate with their countries. <clears throat> I also have foreign liaison officers. I have 15 within United States Southern Command uh, representing our partner nations from the region. Jayat of South, uh, just, uh, just south in Key West, also has uh, a myriad of interagency within that headquarters as well as foreign liaison officers too. These foreign liaison officers have a direct link to their, uh, to their chiefs of defense. So not only do I have a direct link, but they help me. They're really uh, literally and figuratively like translators, not just translating the language, but actually helping to uh, to bridge the gap in terms of maybe communication and helping to explain things further uh, between both of us uh, to make that relationship even better. Uh, academia is really important that we use as a lever in United States Southern Command. And the memorandums of understanding or memorandums of agreement that we use uh, to help with um, uh, to counter the threats and things like that. I have a huge... Um, uh, program for interns within so, uh, Southern Command, and that's with Florida International University. We have agreements with University of Miami and other forms of academia as well as uh, NGOs that are very, very helpful in countering malign activity, but also exposing some of this malign activity. We don't want to get the credit in the United States Southern Command for exposing things, uh, but the, we, will, we will turn that information over to our partner nation where there are things that that aren't quite right uh, that are happening in the region and that go against uh, our partner nations. Um, but all of that uh, working together um, as part of integrated deterrence and as part of Team USA or Team Democracy, I take both because we have a Team USA team but then also a Team Democracy and that's where we're getting after uh, that malign activity and the challenges that we have in the region that our partner nations are dealing with. Uh, just to talk a little bit about that in terms of um, the malign state actors that we have uh, active and very active in the region. I talked about that uh, we do have competition, and I would say that we are very much in strategic competition in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, and with the People's Republic of China, uh, Russia, third would be transnational criminal organizations. Uh, that, uh, that occur in this region. And so certainly with the buildup, the largest military buildup in history on mainland China. And so that is very concerning to me. And then to see the encroachment and to see the tentacles of the PRC into the countries within the Western Hemisphere so close to the United States very much concerns me. And so as I talk again about our neighborhood, I talk about the 20 yard line being in the red zone, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative uh, that has been ongoing for the last over a decade in this region. Uh, 21 of 31 countries that have signed on to this Belt and Road Initiative. I could take Argentina last January, uh, the most recent signatory onto the Belt and Road Initiative, um, and uh, 23 billion in infrastructure projects, that signatory and signing on to that. 
But again, 21 of 31 countries, there are 25 countries that actually have infrastructure projects by the PRC, uh, uh, four that aren't signatories of the BRI, but that do actually have projects uh, within their countries. But not just that, deep water ports in 17 countries. I mean, this is critical infrastructure that's being invested in. I have the most space uh, space enabling infrastructure in the Western Hemisphere, in Latin America and the Caribbean. And I just, I just cause question, you know, why? Why is all of this critical infrastructure being invested in so heavily? Uh, in terms of telecommunications, 5G, I've got five countries with the 5G backbone in this region. I've got 24 countries with the, with the PRC, Huawei, um, 3G, 4G. Five countries have the Huawei uh, backbone infrastructure. Uh, if I had to guess, they'll probably be offered a discount to upgrade uh, and stay within the same uh, PRC network. And so very, very concerning as we work with our countries. But our countries have had a hard time. They've really had a hard time in this hemisphere with COVID. And I would say just with the poverty and the poverty uh, in terms of the residual effects, we have these residual effects in our own country that we see and that we're still, deal still dealing with. Uh, but in Latin America, 107 million was my last figure this past year that I used. Now it's 170 million into poverty in this region alone. It's pretty significant. What I'm starting to see as well is that this economy, the economy impacts to these partner nations is affecting their ability to buy um, equipment. And you know, as I work with our partner nations uh, and they invest in US equipment, which is the best equipment, uh, I must say, I am a little biased, but it is the best equipment. And they also buy into the supply chain of spare parts and all those kinds of things that help to sustain this piece of equipment over many, many years. So in terms of the investment that they're getting, uh, and that equipment to be able to stay operational and the readiness of it uh, is very, very important. But now these partner nations, uh, due to the impacts of their economy, are starting to look at the financing that goes along with it. Not, not necessarily the quality of the equipment, but who has the best finance deal because they can't afford it so much up front. And so that's a big impact. Um, Going back to the, the investment in infrastructure by the PRC, uh, when we talk to some of our countries uh, and, and talk to them about the reason why um, so many are, are, uh, are getting the Chinese tenders or why, why, um, you know, why the selection for uh, the PRC, and they said, well, you got to compete. You know, if they're the only ones that are putting in bids when tenders are going out, then you know the you got to be there to to compete with the with the folks who are competing on the tender. So if not even have the investment or competing or put something forward, uh, then then you know you don't have a chance of getting selected. So um, again, I think the we we need to take pause and and look at this uh, very very clearly. Uh, as to what is happening so close to our homeland in our neighborhood. Another perspective that I have, uh, you know, I can fly to about 80% of this AOR in about two to three hours very, very quickly. As quickly as it takes me to fly from Miami to D.C., um, I can fly to uh, the top part of uh, South America. So I think we've just lost uh, just how quickly and how close uh, this entire region is. If I talk to uh, my number two um, adversary in the region, Russia. I mean, I've got, uh, of course, the countries, uh, Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua with uh, Russia relationships. But what I really look at, and six other countries, by the way, so a total of nine that have Russian equipment uh, uh, in them, and uh, we're working to replace that Russian equipment uh, with United States equipment if those countries want to donate it to Ukraine or uh, the cause that's happening and be able to replace that with, uh, with U.S. equipment. But is the, different, the, the disinformation and how prevalent it is uh, in the Western Hemisphere. Over 30 million followers uh, with Sputnik Mundo and uh, Russia Today, Espanol. And, uh, and we see the spikes, especially with upcoming elections and how much is going on with the disinformation. We have it in our own country. 
but to see it in Latin America and how prevalent it is and how prevalent it is with, uh, with the younger generation is very concerning. And so we work very hard with our partners to try to strengthen their abilities to counter the disinformation as well. And then, of course, transnational criminal organizations. Uh, in my mind, that they, they, uh, they sow the insecurity and the instability in the region, which allows the, the malign state actors, such as the PRC and Russia, to move in and to flourish. But a $310 billion annual revenue business with the TCOs. Um, in my mind, the, the, the insecurity, the instability, causing migration, causing families to be on the move um, is, and it's not just uh, with counter narcotics, it's not just with drugs, it's with human trafficking. Uh, illegal, unregulated, unreported fishing, IUUF, illegal logging, illegal mining. This region, why this region matters with all of its rich resources and rare earth elements. You've got the lithium triangle, which is needed for technology today. 60% of the world's lithium uh, is in the lithium triangle, Argentina, Bolivia, Chile. You just have the largest oil reserves, light sweet crude discovered off of Guyana over a year ago. Um, you have uh, Venezuela's resources as well with, uh, with oil, uh, copper, gold. Um, China gets 36% 36, 36 of its food source from this region. We have the Amazon, uh, lungs of the world. We have 31% of the world's fresh water in this region too. Um, I mean, it's just off the charts. But then when you talk about trade, trade is unbelievable. The trade uh, in the region, you know, I talked about all the ties that we have with this hemisphere. Uh, but the PRC and a lot of our uh, countries in this region are, is the number one trade partner with the United States, uh, number two in most cases, not in most cases, I would say in some cases. Uh, however, uh, to see the increase in investment in trade from 2002 from China, 18 billion, uh, up to 450 billion now, and on its way, what is predicted to be about 750 billion uh, in the near future. And so I think we have a lot at stake. Uh, we have a, a lot to be grateful for in terms of the relationships with our, uh, with our partner nations and our hemisphere that, is, that we're part of and in the Americas, but we have, to, we have a lot to do. This region matters. It has a lot to do with national security, and we need to step up our game, and we need to be faster, and we need to work and deliver capabilities at the speed of relevance for this region. And so thank you again very much for hosting me today, and I, I look forward to the questions and the dialogue. Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, quick housekeeping. I'm sure everyone knows this, but this event is public on the record. Everyone who's been watching it publicly, they probably know that. Um, there's also an opportunity for audience questions on Zoom. So direct any questions to the Admiral on the Q&A tab, and I'm told they will pop up on this laptop, or this iPad for me, so I will read them. So keep General. the questions coming. General. What did I say? Admiral. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I've just switched her service, too. General Richardson. Um, or to any admiral that you want. Just send them my way. I'll ask questions to anyone you need. Um, please, when you're asking your questions, if you could identify yourself and your affiliation, um, and we'll collect them through the events and hopefully get to them at the end. Um, that was a fascinating keynote. I don't know if you saw, but I, I took about 900 notes while you were speaking there, because that was so full of, of information about your region. Um, and I, I want to start, you know, Adrian mentioned that this is going to be a discussion about the risks and the threats and the opportunities mm -hmm. in the region. So let's, yeah. let's start with some of the things that, you know, keep you up at night, the, some of the, the threats. The competition, the investment in the critical infrastructure from China, what is the ultimate goal of China with their recent investments in Southcom. Yeah, great question. And uh, and so with that investment, I worry about the largest, you know, I started off talking about that largest buildup of, of their military and military capability, conventional and nuclear arsenals in their in their mainland. But as I see the uh, the investment within the Western Hemisphere, and certainly we're not, you know, we're behind Africa, we're behind Europe. There's many years of investment in other areas of the world. But with the largest uh, military buildup in their own homeland, 
You know, you got to question why are they investing so heavily everywhere else mm -hmm. across the planet? And, um, and I worry about these dual use state owned enterprises that pop up uh, from the PRC. And I worry about the dual use capability, being able to flip them around and use them for military use. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about critical infrastructure, and we talk about um, with our partner nations about protecting their, their own critical infrastructure as we do in our own homeland here today in the United States. Um, you know, that, that is what worries me and that's what keeps me up at night when they're investing uh, I could take the Panama Canal and the five state-owned enterprises on either side of that critical um, sea line of communication on the Panama Canal. Uh, so yeah, that, that's very concerning. And then the space, the mm -hmm. space infrastructure in terms of the investment. But they are making very um, heavily, uh, heavy investments uh, into uh, this critical infrastructure in the region. I read that, that China has invested heavily in Latin America's space sector. And as part of that, they've been strengthening some of their military ties. You mentioned a couple of the countries that they have close ties with, including Venezuela. Uh, what, is there anything that can be done to stop that momentum by the US? Or, or is, it some, is that more of a conversation that you're having with partners in the region about about what they, they could be doing. And so it. it's both. I think it's an education uh, and making people aware of what's happening uh, and making folks aware that, you know, we're not investing in the region as, as we could or should be. And then also working with our partners, uh, you know, uh, I've, I've said before in other forums, partnering with business executives for national security, so BENS, where they'll, they'll get a group of uh, CEOs that'll go into a country, so they've gone into Panama, they stay there uh, as recent as uh, this past August. And so, uh, you know, looking at the, the feasibility for investment, the transparency, mm -hmm. corruption, our bills paid on, you know, this have this frank discussion with the company from CEOs who uh, can advise and say, you know, this is what I would be concerned with, or this is what is great, and you know, uh, and give their perspective on investment, and how things could improve, or uh, how they can do things to generate that, um, you know, that uh, increase investment. Because I think when you talk about increasing investment in the region, the assumption is, you know, you're coming from the military; it's a right. combatant command. You're talking about sending more military assets into the region, but you're right. actually talking about the U.S investing more in critical infrastructure or talking about making economic investments right. in the Absolutely. region. Absolutely. Absolutely. So if I'm the, uh, as the, the uh, not a lot of visitors maybe or folks that are going into the country or the opportunity that I have while I'm there that I get to see this, meet with leaders, talk to them about their challenges. If I'm the only one that's, that's seeing this and putting it together, then I've got to, I got to be able to talk about it. And I've got to be able to tell folks, you know, hey, this is what I'm seeing and this is, uh, get this whole of government approach uh, going, the momentum going, and get in, uh, getting it where it needs to be in terms of being uh, at the speed of relevance. Do you, when, when you talk to allies and partners about the potential threat from the PRC in the region, I, I know it's, it's hard to generalize this because it's a, it's a very different, the countries are all very different, but do they generally take that to heart? Do you get the sense that that the, that that the message is being received that them investing in this critical infrastructure potentially you know holding some of these economies at ho hostage in some cases do they take that to heart as something that they need to be concerned about? They do, I think they do, and uh, I also think that uh, because of the state of their economies, depending on which country it is, some are. Uh, more desperate than others um, as a result of uh, the impacts. And so um, they might not have a choice. Yeah. So they might be going in uh, fairly eyes wide open, but I think that that message is getting across. Uh, but in some cases, they've got no other choice and there's nobody else there yeah. that's going to be able to deliver. These are democracies uh, for generally the most part in this region that are trying to deliver for their people. And the people are getting, they're getting impatient. Mm -hmm. And they need uh, capability. And they need help now. And then when you talk about how long an administration will be in, you know, in the seat to make a difference, it might just be a one, four-year term if they're able to run again. In some cases, they're not. And so they just see a very finite window, a very short period of time uh, that they're going to be able to make a difference or not. And so 
Uh, in some cases, again, it might, it might be, what can I get the quickest? I go back to the equipment. We see now all of a sudden, you know, uh, looking uh, elsewhere other than U.S. equipment, who has the better finance package? Oh, but minister, you got to look at the equipment. You got to look at what you get. It, you can't compare. Well, uh, I need to know, you know, what about the financing? Mm -hmm. That's more important to me right now. But Russia can't be provide can't have the ability to provide many of these countries with with resupply or or new weapons. I mean, they're struggling to supply themselves in many cases for Ukraine. So is that presenting an opportunity for maybe the U.S. to slide it in? It is, absolutely. And we're taking advantage of that, I'd like to say. So uh, we are working with those countries that have the Russian equipment to um, either donate it or, or switch it out for United States equipment. Are, you, are countries taking? They are, yeah. Any you are. can say here? Or? Uh, uh, not really here, but the, uh, those are in the works, and we are working that, and we've been very aggressive to work, uh, to work that and to be deliver at the speed of relevance, right? So they have a capability. The sanctions are working because they're having a hard time getting spare parts and things like that to keep the, the, um, the weapon systems capable in some cases, or the vehicles, or the aircraft. Um, speaking of Russia, you know, the national defense strategy, which we often refer to when we're talking about the COCOMs and the threats, uh, being a, a major player in the national defense strategy as well, another pacing challenge. How is, you mentioned disinformation, but how is disinformation or Russia's efforts in the region having a real practical impact? Is Are you seeing that in... Um, elections you mentioned, are you seeing it in other ways that is potentially destabilizing the region because of these efforts? I do. I think the, um, our adversaries don't play by the rules. We have rules that we got to play by. And I, I shouldn't, you know, uh, it's not about playing, it's about operating. And we follow those rules. So in some cases, our, um, our competitors, our adversaries uh, have a leg up. And so we've got, that's why it requires us to be pretty innovative. Uh, and uh, pretty aggressive and responsive to what's happening. Mm -hmm. And then also help our partners. What I see, you know, in terms of our investment, and I could just say writ large in terms of the investment that we do in training, education, things like that with our partner nations, they turn right around uh, with that investment and put it to good use. And uh, quite honestly, what we see in that investment, I could take the work that we do with Jayat of South, the investment in our partner nations, uh, uh, increased and has continued to increase every year, 62% that they're involved uh, in the disruptions and interdictions that take place uh, with the counter-narcotics, the investments that we make in our partner nations. And that's exactly what you want. Yeah. We don't want to have to, United States, do everything. We want to we want to be able to train, we want to be able to invest, and then uh, double the efforts in terms of getting after the malign activities. The, China's efforts in the region are kind of transparent in their ultimate goals and some of their ultimate goals, but Russia's aren't necessarily, to me, as obvious. What do you think the goal is for Russia in getting more and more? Is it just to sow chaos in the area to create instability, or do you think there's other strategic goals for efforts in South? And yeah, so I think uh, to continue with uh, being so close to our homeland, so close to the United States, being able to keep up those relationships. We saw that high level, two high level delegations that visited Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua prior to the invasion of Ukraine. And so they will keep up those relationships as long as they can to keep that foothold in the region. Mm -hmm. And so the more that they can sow um, that insecurity, that instability, those relationships, uh, and, and keep countries looking away from the United States and away from democracies is what they choose to do. What about military, some sort of forward military basing there? Do you see any increase in Russia's efforts to have actual military assets there. They seem to have enough a relationship with some of these countries that they, they can yeah. they can do visits at least. But what about right. some sort of a more forward presence? Yeah, so I think that that's been um, stalled uh, somewhat because of the invasion and because of the sanctions and because of what's occurring. Uh, but you can't just rely on that, that it's going to stay that way. And so, um, but I would say for the basing and that sort of thing, if, if when they have the opportunity, they will try to increase what they have in these countries that they already have a foothold in and then try to spread, uh, spread out as, as well into the countries where they, are, we, they already have Russian equipment, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, you also mentioned drug trafficking and, and counter-narcotics efforts. How have you, you've been in the job now a year and a half, I guess, roughly. 
how have you seen that change over that time? Um, it, it's, it's, you said it's $300 billion plus in revenue from these transnational criminal organizations. How have you seen that evolve? How do you see that evolving? Um, do you see that it's made, there's been any real change in stopping the flow of both drugs coming from the region and then also migration? Have you seen any change in um, and how they've been able to halt human trafficking and migration? That was a big question with a lot of different parts to it. <laughs> can, can you update us on where that on where that stands? I guess. So I have a I have a graphic where you know it has the 300 billion, 310 billion there in the center, and then it has all the other activities other than counter narcotics, but the human trafficking, the mm -hmm. uh, the IAUF, the illegal logging, mining, all of it all that malign activity. And then you have the money laundering too, right? Which is really following the money is really where we need that whole of government approach really to, to in my opinion, to focus on from Richardson's foxhole uh, because that the ability to be able to keep that, uh, that huge revenue uh, going. Um, uh, if I just talk about the, 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 uh, the PRC banks in the region, seven with over 270 some branches okay. within the region, uh, and so, you know, the, when, when you talk about the interagency and the importance of that and being able to partner with the interagency to get after that problem set. Um, but the, in terms of what I've seen over the, the, the time that I've been in command is that these, these uh, transnational criminal organizations are, and, and I could use a quote that, uh, that President Petro used in Colombia, it's the same people, they're just way more powerful. Hmm and getting after it until we start, uh, you know, interdicting a semi-submersible that's loaded with, with counter narcotics or, and drugs, um, you, you gotta go where the, where the labs are. You gotta go where it's being grown. You've gotta go, you, you can't just hit, uh, you know, the, the eaches. You have to go where um, the sources are. Do you and see that so, as a potential role for the U.S. though, or is that more that the countries are with potential U.S. support? Yeah, I, I think it's uh, that's what that's what our partner nations are dealing with, and generally that's at the top of their list mm -hmm. in terms of not just you know delivering a democracy, delivering for their people, but uh, causing the insecurity and the instability that they're having to deal with internally. And I think our countries are looking more so to um, to the military helping, right? Because it's too big for just the police to 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 handle internally. Mm -hmm. And so while you, you, know, you want the militaries to focus on securing their borders and uh, you know, they're, they're keeping their country safe and secure, uh, they're being asked to do more internal uh, type roles. I, I could take the pandemic. We were doing the same thing in our country you know, with our Department of Defense helping with medical professionals and uh, during COVID and running vaccine sites and things like that uh, to help out an overwhelmed um, system. So. Uh, our partner nations are being asked to do more and more mm -hmm. internal within their country as a result of these transnational criminal organizations. You also mentioned a couple times that you know you 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 need more resources, right? I know no COCOM commander or commander is ever going to say that they have enough. They always need more resources, but it is true that Southcom is often seen as one of the economy of forces of the combatant commands. How do you how do you deal with that when you're when you're managing these relationships with partners and allies? knowing that you aren't always getting what you need to help them, or you right. aren't always getting what you need to face these many threats that you have in your region. How do you deal with that? And when you, when you talk to lawmakers too, how do you convince mm -hmm. them what you kept telling us here today that the region matters? Right. So I think they, uh, in terms of with our partner nations, you know, the, uh, um, having them, um, um, I, I don't tell them I don't get everything I need. I just tell them everything that I'm doing to, to get them what they, you know, what they need and what they think that they require and working with their political leadership. Everything we do with our partner nations is based on human rights, the rule of law, the professionalization of their military. And I think what we've, what we've seen uh, over the past, uh, I could just take the year and a half with the elections that we've had and uh, in Chile and Honduras and uh, Colombia and, uh, and then also uh, uh, with Brazil and, and the unrest that's happening in Peru and things like that and the, what the military is doing and how they're doing it and upholding their constitutions and their rule of law. 
And so uh, trying to make them stronger, but stronger to handle the challenges. And then working with them if they need hardware, if they need education, if they need training. They need resiliency training now, right? Uh, helping with those things. Their programs might not be as far along as those in the United States. Uh, I have in the audience, I have my Command Sergeant Major Ben Jones. And uh, he's uh, uh, spearheading a senior enlisted development program within the hemisphere. Huge. That's what makes our United States military so strong. I think it's the secret sauce to our military is our enlisted leaders and our enlisted force. And in some cases, uh, a few of the militaries don't even have the enlisted uh, rank. They, they, they've got to develop it. And we're helping them do that. If they have it, make it stronger. And if they don't, how do you develop it, the program of instruction, all of this uh, to help them out uh, in terms of. So women, peace, and security, I could take that. You know, the integration of women into their forces. Happy to say Columbia selected their first senior enlisted leader for the entire military, uh, Com Command Sergeant Major Consuela Diaz. Really, really proud of the efforts that are happening in the Western Hemisphere. So we have a lot, while there's a lot of challenges, a lot of competition, uh, but it forces us to work other levers that our competitors don't have. Now, while they're trying to use our own playbook against us, they don't have the power to convene. And what I mean that, by that, I don't mean to use power in the sense of the power, but it's the ability to have an exercise and have 26 partner nations come together. Defense of the Panama Canal. We have a, a, an annual exercise called Panamax. Mm -hmm. 26 partner nations. Uh, that come together for that exercise. I have a total of eight annual exercises that we run, and over 20 partner nations are a part of that on each and every one. And so, and it, it, it just didn't start like three years ago. I mean, uh, for example, our maritime exercise, UNITAS. If I'm in Brazil, I would say UNITAS, but uh, UNITAS is a 69 year old exercise trade winds, several decades that we've run this. I mean, it has, it's, they're legendary, but it brings our teams together. Um, in terms of looking for other levers, National Guard State Partnership Program is huge. We have the largest National Guard State Partnership Program. Uh, it has come up a couple times with Ukraine. Ukraine has the uh, State Partnership Program with California. Mm -hmm. How did we initially start our, our uh, 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 great coordination with Ukraine, it was leveraged through the National Guard State Partnership Program that California had. But I have the largest out of any of the COCOMs. I have 24 state partnership programs. Utilize those to the nth degree in terms of another lever. United States Corps of Engineers. Uh, they have, while the Chinese has a, uh, like over 50 billion in projects over the past uh, five years in the region, Corps of Engineers, about 250 million. But in some cases, uh, they're, they're actually helping to fix some of the um, shoddy projects that the PRC did in the region. Um, but they're a trustworthy sort of another lever. So um, it, it gets us out to team with others as part of that team democracy, AKA integrated deterrence, mm -hmm. right? Um, that, uh, that we're looking for ways to partner and to get synergy and the interagency and academia and anybody that wants to be part of team democracy to get after the malign activity in the region. So do you feel that you have enough to project power through the region then with what, what you're given, with your resources? You mentioned a couple times, res you know, the need for right. more resources. Right. Do you think that you have enough to project power to, to go to these partners and allies <laughs> and say we are a reliable, the United States is a reliable partner here and we will continue in the region, or do you need more? I think that the, our partners know that we're reliable and they know that we're capable because they see what we're able to do with Ukraine. That's just one example, mm -hmm. right? And so the reach back that I have as a COCOM, while I might not be the priority right now, the reach back is there. The capabilities are there. And so what we try to do on a daily basis is be aggressive with what we do need to keep this region from becoming a hotspot, from working with our partner nations, investing in them, bringing other ways of investment, not just, it's not just all about military, right? Uh, you know, the, um, it was suggested just a, a couple months ago is that maybe when I do my travels in the region uh, is meet with AmCham, you know, mm -hmm. uh, Chamber of Commerce. 
uh, work with the countries in terms of projects. What shovel-ready projects do we have that are, do you have, that are ready to go? And if you don't, let's get some, ready, some uh, projects together and then try to marry up that uh, investment, working with the U.S. Embassy right there uh, with our partner nation. And, uh, you know, it's kind of that build it, they will come yeah. mentality. Uh, and then the power of just getting people together. Um, just, uh, just yesterday, um, we had a, I had a Zoom call with uh, the ambassador, U.S. ambassadors from Argentina and Chile, and then also the um, strategy officer from Levant, uh, and then also the uh, VP for global operations from Albemarle for lithium, to talk about the lithium, uh, lithium triangle. Uh, in Argentina, Bolivia, and Chile, and the companies, how they're doing, and, and what they see uh, in terms of challenges and things like that in the lithium business, and then the aggressiveness or the uh, influence and coercion uh, from the PRC. And so the ability to get those groups together uh, uh, to leverage, you know, what's really happening on the ground and how can we help and, and you know, who else can we bring to the table to help us figure this problem out and box out our adversaries, box out our competitors by teaming together with each other and others. Huh. I, I wonder at how, as the first woman in, the, in this job for the United States, if that has, have you noticed that that's had any impact when you're dealing with some of these partners or allies? You know, and, and how, you know, Adrian mentioned that you're this, only the second four-star woman, four-star in the Army. Ann Dunwoody, I believe, was the first, right? And right. Um, how has that changed how you look at your challenges and your opportunities in the region, you, you know, specifically with some of your efforts with women, peace, and security <laughs> in the region? How, how has that colored how you've, you've looked at the job? I think the... Um, um, I think just just in like my DNA, uh, I like to uh, and and by nature of this command, uh, doing the team building thing and bringing folks together and trying to talk about the challenges, not necessarily present solutions because we might not have solutions, but the team building piece of it and bringing the people together to communicate and being able to do that and then. Uh, in some cases, the you know some of our partner nations in terms of women, peace, and security, and women in integration and their forces, they might have a national action plan, mm -hmm. uh, but really not have a whole lot going on in terms of the real moving that program forward. Or in uh, another case, very huge positive case, have no action plan, but then they got all this integration going on, and so. Um, I think just bringing the uh, leaders together when we do women, peace, and security events. Um, and talk about the challenges that are that those people are facing. What's really really neat in the with our partner nations is it's not just bringing the women to the table. You have just as many men that are there uh, talking about the challenges and things. You know barriers to out uh, to compete mm -hmm. uh, within the force and things like that. And I think it's really good to, for those uh, chiefs of defense and the service leads to uh, to hear what their service members have to say. And so um, I think it's more uh, from the team building aspect and bringing people together to broker ideas and ways to move forward and hear things that they might not have heard before, mm -hmm. but in an environment where it's not judgmental or anything like that. It's just really meant to better them um, and the investment uh, to try to help them be better. Do you think that you, I mean, when a, a, a woman, four-star general, walks in in this position and walks into these meetings, do you think that that encourages them to bring more, more women into their military or bring them more into the national security space? I think it does, but I think it, 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 that's not enough, right? I mean, it's what, what, do, what else, do, what do I have to bring to the table and what are we going to talk about and how are we going to get after it and do I really mean what I say, <laughs> right? Do I, I can talk all day long, but do I really walk the walk that I'm talking about? And so I think that that's really important, too, to be able to follow through, that I'm just not ta saying it, and then it, it, it sounds nice. Uh, you got to be able to deliver. And so uh, that, that causes me to now you know, be able to go to the Pentagon and inform the chairman, inform the secretary of defense, uh, the president, and make sure that you know, uh, my, uh, my chain of command is tracking what I know and how we can make a difference and how they can, they can help. 
uh, with that and what resources uh, can be brought to bear to, uh, to change the situation for the positive, to outcompete. I know one thing that Southcom has, has done quite a bit of that doesn't get a whole lot of attention is these efforts, humanitarian efforts, specifically with medical clinics. Right. And, and you said that 170 million in poverty. I mean, that's a pretty, that's a, a devastating number for the region. Do you see that continuing? And, and can you talk a little bit about um, if there have been any ways that when, when, you've, when Southcom has done these um, these medical clinics in, in these more remote rural areas, is there any, what's the outcome of that? Mm -hmm. Can you point to any sort of practical <clears throat> outcomes that you see or, or advantages of doing those? So I um, would like to, to highlight, we just had the United States Naval ship Comfort. So the, there's two of them, Comfort and Mercy. We had the Comfort that was uh, in the region for 52 days on a 52 day deployment and went to five countries, a little over a week in every country. And, um, and what they do is they, uh, we have uh, General Able team up. It's just a huge operation. And I had no idea until I had it in my region and was part of the process and my staff had been planning um, with all of these countries as well as with the United States Navy and, and the, the, sh the naval ship staff. But uh, every country we go to, so we would harness you know, that ability to use, um, utilize and have medical students from the universities as part of that. Uh, and um, while they might not be able, they might not be able to be doing medical things uh, on the ship or in the clinics, but they would be, they could be interpreters. They were part of the operation. We have non-governmental organizations that are part of this. We had all these humanitarian groups that are part of this and donating equipment. So with the ship, every place we go, I could take Colombia, going into Cartagena, Colombia. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then uh, the, the typical template is taking uh, capabilities and setting up two clinics in marginalized, um, poverty-stricken areas and setting up like in a coliseum or a big, um, just a big warehouse or something like that to allow uh, all the different clinics to set up two of these. And then uh, surgeries were done on the ship. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we would have uh, tabletop exercises for, uh, for disaster response. We would be donating tents. We would be having some sort of uh, disaster exercise. And then subject matter exchanges with medical folks that would actually go in clinics and do uh, doctors and nurses and things like that, teaching and training. Or we would have technicians going in to fix x-ray machines that are broken or MRI machines. Mm -hmm. And then also doing the wraparound activities. Um, there's a band on the ship, no less, right? <laughs> doing like seven concerts in the, you know, in the region. Or we have the dental shop or the dental office that, um, you know, some of these areas, I went to a, a, what we call a medical exercise in Honduras. And I was going there to conduct the change of command for our uh, Joint Task Force Bravo. And then went out to see a med ready where our medical clinic had set up in a very small town and, and treated 3,000 wow. children and moms. Um, no dads were there uh, that when I was there, but tons of kids. They set up in a, in a school, very poor, handing out toothbrushes, teaching children how to, how to brush their teeth, uh, antibiotics to treat just basic you know, uh, infections or things like that. And they don't come back with any of what they, other than their, you know, their, their tools and things like that that they, that they use. But all the antibiotics are, are issued out and just the treatment of that. The president's uh, niece was there as part of the, one of the organizations that was helping. But it's this teaming effort. So again, where does that take that? Well, it gets after just about every one of those presidents' priorities. Mm -hmm. Right, their priorities to take care of their people, get to those marginalized populations that are having a hard time, that are hard to get to, and helping them. And so we're looking at expanding that program. We have medical uh, readiness exercises, surgical readiness exercises. We have a trauma training that we do with Honduras where we bring our uh, medical trauma physicians from Brook Army Medical Center into the region for about a month period of time where they get their trauma training. And so it's programs like that that get after, it's like a twofer, mm -hmm. right? It keeps up our readiness, but then it also tremendously helps um, the population, so. I, I wanna ask a little bit about you. Uh, you, were a, you earned your pilot's license at age 16, is that correct? I did. 
Yes. And you went on to fly Blackhawks in the military, in the Army. Mm -hmm. Do you miss that? Do you miss flying? I do. I do. I, I Are love, you critical of your pilots when I, they fly you around the world? I can't no? be. Okay, yeah. I can be like a backseat <laughs> driver, but they, uh, um, the, I, I'm from Colorado, so I got to fly in a beautiful place, right? And then uh, I have uh, spent a lot of time in the 101st Airborne Division, and they used to have gliders, uh, not, not when I was there, uh, but anyway, in, the, in World War II. And uh, we had a glider field that was close by for, to where I flew out of and took my flying lessons. And I thought, my God, we're so lucky lucky to have an engine, yeah. <laughs> you know, these pilots in World War II, you know, um, I don't know how they did it, but the, yeah, it's pretty tremendous. But the opportunities in the military are off the charts. And so, you know, as we, um, as we, we've got to get after recruiting yeah. and, uh, you know, national service, uh, part of that story is all of the great things that you get to do in the military. I mean, sometimes you just, you're just pinching yourself, like, I can't believe I'm sitting here. I can't believe I get to do this, uh, have the opportunity to do this, being in a position um, to watch other people, uh, being able to make history. I mean, it, it's just it's mm -hmm. unbelievable, the opportunities in the military for men and women. So I'm going to ask, what was your most memorable, favorite, funniest situation as a pilot, as a Black Hawk pilot? Probably when, and my husband hates it, but the, <laughs> when he was, we were, we were both in the um, uh, flying in Iraq on the, uh, right after the initial invasion. We were part of that, uh, but we, on a couple of the missions, um, the, uh, um, we would pull together, the division would pull together all of the lift assets and lift all the infantry, and we would leapfrog forward throughout Iraq, and then his aircraft were the Apaches, but... Uh, his Apache took some some rounds and uh, was uh, he was trying to limp home and the Blackhawks, you know, the ones that don't have all the the big rockets and missiles on them, uh, were helping him make sure that he got home. So, so you escorted probably, your husband home, yes, in combat. Yes. Yeah. Were there any words exchanged at the end of that? Of course. Flight home? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you very much. I, um, we really appreciate your time here. I promise I was not, I think that my iPad was not working uh, with questions, so I wasn't just hogging the time, but you are, it, it's a very engaging conversation, so it's easy to keep asking questions. Um, thank you so much for your time today. Thank, thank you. you to the Atlantic Council for hosting this, this fascinating event as part of this series, and we look forward to the next one. Thank you. Thank you.